We left our three adventurers in the entrance to a cavern system, and for now, that is where we will leave them. Since Immeral's departure, I've been keeping an eye out, and two more people have caught my eye. The first is Septima Van Deer, an elf from Shimmerglade. Her thirst for knowledge and interest in books has enabled her to harness arcane powers, but she feels she has learned all she can at home and has decided to venture out to Silverhaven in the hopes of joining the Spellweavers Academy. It's where all the best wizards go. The other is Calla Marigold, a half-orc with greenish skin and flowers in her hair. A bright yellow cloak hangs from her shoulders, dyed with the pigments of her favourite flower. She has been living in Candlemarsh, learning to harness nature and painting with the colours from whatever she can find. She, too, has grown curious about what the world might hold, particularly after painting a beautiful, tall-spired tower, a place she has never seen or heard of, but where she feels she must go. It was Septima who caught my eye first, a graceful, delicate elf walking with determination from Shimmerglade towards Candlemarsh. She was so lost in her thoughts that she didn't notice when she veered from the road, ending up skirting around Candlemarsh entirely rather than going through it. She did eventually get back to the right place as the late afternoon wore on, but the marshlands aren't known for their paving, and she found herself having to cross wooden bridges, which, though rustic in their creation, did appear to be well maintained. Never having been in such an area before, she was unaware of the potential dangers, a glowing law attracting her attention, drawing her straight to a giant frog which wrapped its sticky tongue around her. It was at this point that Calla, more familiar with the marsh, came across her. She was surprised to see a beautiful live elven woman grappled by a huge frog and calling for help. Calla, being a lover of nature, attempted to reason with it before casting shillelagh on her staff and whacking it, causing it to drop Septima. A short scuffle ensued which largely consisted of both the frog and Calla failing to hit each other, whilst Septima gradually flame-grilled it with her firebolts. At one point it did manage to grab her again, but Calla grabbed the frog by its hind legs and pulled forcing it to release its grip. Once the frog had been reduced to little more than ash floating on the surface of the murky water, the two women took a moment to talk, introducing themselves and discovering that they were heading in a similar direction. They decided it would be wise to travel together, neither of them ever having been this far north before. They continued a little further, the path turning into a dimly lit forest. The two crept through as quietly as possible, Septima gracefully placing each step to avoid any broken twigs. Calla, in an attempt to emulate her, managed to step on every single one, cracking and crunching her way along. As they ventured deeper, they began to notice thick, sticky cobwebs. Septima was able to dodge and weave her way through them, but Calla, despite her best efforts, found the end of her quarterstaff becoming wrapped in the silvery strands. It didn't become completely stuck, but the motion as it was pulled through sent vibrations along the web. Calla stood as still as she could, Septima seeing her shaking with the effort, as long, black, spindly legs came into view in the treetops above. A giant spider ensnared Septima in its web, and a second hungry spider joined it, this one trapping Kala. A lengthy battle ensued as the women broke free and attacked. Septima, badly hurt by this time, and Kala, also taking a fair bit of damage, decided to flee. Kala was the first to make her escape. Septima's pursuit halted as she was once more caught in the spider webs. Calla came back to free her, then ran again. This pattern went on for a while, Septima becoming wrapped in the webs and Calla running back and forth. 
They did manage to inflict a fair bit of pain on both spiders, and as the injured creatures started to retreat, Septimus sent magic missiles which blasted into them, their bodies crackling as they lay on their backs, legs, at least those that were still attached, curled in. The pair did not hang about, but pushed on into a slightly less dank area. Here they decided to take a short rest. Calla spent her time painting, choosing to depict the spiders in all their terrifying glory. At least, that's what she was trying to paint. What she actually painted was something rather different. Oh, but <laughs> I can't tell you what. That's Calla's secret to share. Septima, meanwhile, took a book out from her bag and quietly read it. Tusk Love. I'm not familiar with that one myself. After gathering themselves and Kala harvesting some blooms for pigment, and most definitely not discovering a skeleton that was absolutely not curled up in a hollow tree stump, which the DM failed to notice when selecting the map, they decided to head north. There was a small stream and some gentle music coming from beyond it, and some rustling coming from behind them. As they slowly turned, they noticed two awakened shrubs right beside them. The bushes struck out with their thorny branches. Septima used her firebolts and Kala her quarterstaff to beat the shrubbery into submission. Thankfully, this did not take too long and they left the bushes broken and burnt as they easily crossed the narrow brook. By now it was past sunset and in the darkness they saw the welcoming glow of a campfire, a small tent and a figure beside it. The music was coming from that direction and they crept closer to see if they could make out any more detail in the flickering firelight. A petite woman in bright pink harem trousers and a balloon-sleeved blouse, both embroidered with gold, and colourful scarves tied around her waist, sat cross-legged, strumming a lute. Her pink, purple and blue hair as colourful as her clothing. They called out to her and she invited them to come and join her. She introduced herself as Talia and explained that she was travelling, touring Ebendale and playing. They told her a little about themselves and she, in turn, shared that she was part of the Scarlet Sun Carnival, which travelled around, entertaining and astounding people. As the three roasted giant rats on sticks by the fire, Calla noticed a golden sun tattoo on Talia's wrist. Asking her about it, she learned that it was a symbol of membership of the carnival, managed by Lady Zabilna, and that it moved in and out of the Fey Realm. Talia told them that they should attend the carnival if they ever came across it, but warned them not to stay for too long. Kella asked about her colourful clothing and Talia gave her a small container of pigment that glowed a beautiful lilac shade made from violet fungus which Talia had fought in the Feywild. Kella used it to paint an image of Talia, the resulting performance check meaning it turned out more in the style of Picasso. Kella noticed something else in the painting too, something she was sure she hadn't painted and that definitely wasn't there. Talia complimented her on her unique style and offered to keep watch whilst the two slept. She looked intensely at Kalla, telling her that Lady Zabilna would be very interested in her. Kalla asked how she would find this lady and Talia told her that Zabilna would find her if she wanted to. She could always find you, no matter where you were. Kala bedded down and Septima, being an elf who only needed a four-hour trance, chatted a bit with Talia into the night. Both awoke next morning rested and feeling stronger. Talia explained they should be careful of the way ahead, as things in the woodlands weren't always as they seemed. She bid them farewell, giving first Kala this D6 will inspire you in the killing you do. And then Septima. I touch the elf when I want her to kill stuff. I touch the elf and give her a D6 buff. A little bardic inspiration to aid them on their way. 
After an hour or so of walking, they came across a ruined building. Heeding Talia's words, they approached with caution, noticing a toad-like humanoid standing, holding a spear, blinking slowly, definitely not looking friendly. They snuck around the perimeter, successfully keeping low and quiet as they moved. However, as they came around the eastern side of the ruins, Septima tripped, falling into Kala and pushing her to the ground. Both let out a gasp as they crashed to the mossy earth. As they stood up, they heard movement, and two more of these creatures emerged, attacking immediately. Their companion at the front, alerted by the noise, began to make its way round. Septima fought bravely, but these creatures were merciless, and she was knocked unconscious. Kala called upon her connection to nature to cast healing word. As the bullywug that had felled Septima raised its spear, bloodlust in its eyes as it prepared to slam it down and finish her off, she sat up, cast firebolt, and watched as its expression briefly changed to one of surprise before it changed into a steaming pile of ash on the ground, a small puff of smoke drifting into the air. The two remaining Bullywugs fought hard, but the women fought harder. A second one was reduced to a pile of ash, while the third had its brain beaten out of its skull by Kala's staff. Sensing no further imminent danger, the two decided to explore the ruins. They could tell that the dilapidated building had once been a place of worship, though neither knew which god it had been dedicated to. There was no evidence of the Bullywugs having eaten or slept there, and the structure had clearly been created by a more skilled species. They came across a crypt, almost walking into it, as the floor of the room above it had almost completely rotted away. Kala took her hempen rope and tied it to the sturdiest thing she could find, abseiling the eight feet or so down. There was a single coffin. Septima came next, her foot pushing into a piece of weakened masonry, causing her to slip. Kala could only watch as her friend landed on her back, directly on top of the coffin, the force causing it to break. Septima felt something hard, sharp and slightly soft beneath her. She jumped up in a panic, relieved to find the softness was remnants of clothing and nothing organic. The two seemed disappointed to find nothing more in the crypt. I offered them a zombie, but they declined. They're lost. They were able to climb back up, Kala going first to aid Septima. Kala inspected the pile of ash that until recently had been a bullywug as they left, finding two silver pieces and a weak healing potion. She went to look at the other ash pile while Septima approached the juicier corpse. There was nothing in the ash, but as Septima looked at the body, she recalled that these creatures were amphibious in nature and it was likely they needed regular immersion. She also remembered something about licking them having a strange effect. She told Kala, who attempted to harvest the gland that produced this substance, but in her enthusiasm, she punctured it. With nothing else of note, the two decided to carry on. We will leave them for now making their way through the woodland and return to the party of three. Alistair was first to sneak into the cavern, carefully exploring it. Gera, his human eyes lacking dark vision, lit a torch as Merrick dissolved into the darkness on the opposite side to Alistair. No traps, no signs of life, no sounds other than the clanking of Gera's plate armour. They could see tracks, scuffs in the dirt, as if from things running away. They headed towards the tunnel to the right, the unmistakable stench of goblin occupancy drifting on the musty air. They crept slowly down, Gera hanging back. Alistair spotted a crudely constructed rope and log trap, which he was able to disarm without difficulty. The tunnel opened into a cavern, full of evidence of goblin activity, but now deserted. Empty tents, cold campfires, not even a scavenging rat. The three thoroughly explored the area, finding nothing of interest bar some plants, which they determined to be those which Harvest Keeper Clutie used to make healing potions 
Alistair and Merrick each plucked some while Gera poked around, finding rotting vegetables and remnants of goblin meals. They decided to return to the main entrance and try the northern route. Once again, Alistair and Merrick went first, Gera hanging back. Still, no signs of life or sounds, other than those they were making. Roughly hewn steps led up to a platform in the otherwise naturally formed cavern. A large, dark archway into a shallow room, the tunnel curving around. Alistair stayed low whilst Merrick went up to the platform, finding nothing of interest. Carefully, the trio crept round, noting some humanoid footsteps in the dirt of the cavern floor, also heading towards the entrance. They could not discern what had made them, or exactly when, but they could tell they were made within the last few weeks. Continuing on, the passage widened into a room containing several crudely made statues. After inspecting one, they decided to forge ahead, their recent experience with the animated armour in the tower still fresh in their minds. They could see that the cavern changed from something natural to something clearly carved out on purpose, the floor tiled with stone. Yet they could not enter. They found their way blocked, as if by an invisible wall. They decided they must have to do something with the statues. Alistair picked one, approached, and put a silver piece in its empty bowl. A low, grinding sound as it turned to look at him, and the fight was on. Despite being large, it was hard to damage, the nature of its form being naturally strong. They noticed the attacks which did hit did not appear to do as much damage as expected. Gera, noting this, tried casting lightning lore a couple of times, but the gargoyle easily avoided the effects. Far too strong for the cantrip. Eventually, after a lengthy combat, Merrick fired an arrow into the area already badly damaged by melee blows from the other two. It shattered. Silence. Alistair retrieved his coin. Realising the danger they were in, Merrick warily aimed and fired an arrow at another statue, watching as it struck it between the eyes and fell harmlessly to the floor. Stillness. Merrick inspected it, noting there was ash in the bowl this one was holding. He lit some incense and placed it in the bowl. It burned away, the scent filling the air, but nothing else happened. After a short discussion, they approached another statue, again checking the bowl. It was empty. Alistair placed a coin in it, and once more it came to life. Another tough combat, Gera finally destroying it, slashing it diagonally from shoulder to stony hip with Dawnbreaker. Merrick, assisted by Alistair, inspected the remaining statues. Three had bowls of ash, two had empty bowls. Alistair reluctantly tore the most boring page from Wicked Wizards, lighting it and placing it in the bowl. They decided to place a coin in one of the empty bowls. A third combat, this time Alistair making the killing blow, running it through with his short sword. Having sustained quite some damage, they decided to take a short rest. However, before they could do anything, Gera became aware that Dawnbreaker seemed to be emitting a very dim, pale blue glow. As he was processing this, he was struck by three blasts of something dealing necrotic damage, a fourth attack missing. Two spectral forms appeared. Whilst Alistair and Merrick did their best to attack them, it was clear they had one target in mind. Gera was attacked mercilessly until he fell unconscious, at which point the spirits dissipated. Merrick rushed over to cast Cure Wounds, bringing Gera back to consciousness. His companions wanted to know what was going on. Gera told them he had no idea, but that Dawnbreaker had not always been his sword. It had previously belonged to a warlock whom he had killed. He told them he didn't know what those things were, or why they appeared. And he doesn't. But I do. <laughs> The three retreated to the goblin camp to take a short rest, none of them being in a state to face any further enemies. Before they left, Gera scouted around a final time. 
This time he found his way up to a small ledge they had previously bypassed. It had clearly been where goblin lookouts had watched over the camp, remnants of rotting bedding and poorly made goblin weaponry. Amongst this detritus, Gera discovered a dull chisel, finely made. He took it, and the three returned to the statue room. By now they figured that the statues with empty bowls needed a coin placed in the bowl to activate them. This was highly amusing. The coins weren't necessary at all. They simply had to interact and the gargoyle would awaken and attack. At least these ones were wingless. Gera decided to summon his glaive rather than Dawnbreaker for this fight. The fourth one was eventually killed by another well-aimed arrow from Merrick. Gloomstalkers. They attempted to enter the passage previously blocked somehow, but it was still blocked. By now the fires they had lit earlier had burned out. Whilst Merrick and Alistair debated what to do, Gera backtracked to inspect the small dark alcove. Noting he had gone, Merrick and Alistair followed. Discovering a small but well-made leather satchel within, recently placed, Alistair carefully opened it after checking it for traps. Inside, he found a library card for the Silver Haven Spellstone Library in the name of Sulian Dandash, a pouch of money and a small rolled up piece of parchment which he handed off to Merrick. Merrick opened it and saw it seemed to be some sort of code or cipher. He went to check whether any of the statues had glyphs on them whilst Alistair equipped his new man bag of holding, stuffing his backpack into it. The three soon realised that they had not yet encountered anything with the symbols matching those on the parchment and debated the order in which to place small fires in the bowls of the four remaining statues. They went around each, this time using their tinder boxes. Once all four were alight, they tried again to move forwards. This time, there was nothing to hinder their progress. They carefully entered, but what awaits them, both they and you, will have to wait to find out. <laughs>